Luke's English Podcast is made possible thanks to donations from my listeners, and you can donate to the podcast using one of the yellow PayPal buttons on my website. Also, it's supported by the premium subscription, and you can sign up to become a premium subscriber at teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. Also, the podcast is supported by sponsors. Today's sponsor is, as usual, italki. Uh, I talk about italki a lot. I just think it's a good um, sort of uh, mix like listening to the podcast regularly and also doing plenty of speaking practice on italki there are loads and loads of teachers to choose from qualified uh native speakers of english uh, as teachers and also uh there are native speakers available who are not teachers but you can just talk to them they're they're called community tutors they're a bit cheaper than the the teachers that's good for conversation practice and and uh stuff like that so anyway check out italki it can be a really, really good way to improve your spoken fluency in English. Uh, and remember, when you buy some talking time, italki will send you a voucher for a free lesson. Uh, to get the offer, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or click an italki logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, folks, and welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. This is episode number 621, and it's called British TV Dragon's Den Part 3, Discord in the Den. So this is the third part. Obviously, you should listen to parts one and two before you listen to this one. And so I was thinking to myself, it would be interesting to explore a couple of other pitches on the TV show Dragon's Den. So that's what we're going to do here, okay? And um, so, now I've got no notes in front of me. I haven't actually prepared anything in advance. So the entire thing I'm going to do here is completely spontaneous. I've seen the other two pitches which feature in episode one from series eight of Dragon's Den, the BBC production. So I've that's the episode I used for the last video where we listened to a pitch by a girl called Kirsty Henshaw. So two other pitches from that episode. Now I watched them sort of quickly, kind of just to have a quick look. I'd used the Kirsty Henshaw one a few times before, so I knew that one, but I had a quick look at what the other ones were like in that episode. And they're quite interesting. And the thing is about both of those pitches is that there's like disagreement going on. So I thought it would be quite interesting to listen to pitches which are you know just a bit different where you get discussion and sort of argument and it all gets a bit tense and there's disagreement that's what discord means discord is basically disagreement or arguing between people so both of the uh, pitches that we're going to listen to and hopefully we'll listen to both of them i'm going to get straight to the point and get started properly in just a second Uh, both of them involve people disagreeing with each other and I thought that might be interesting to listen to right if you're learning English you also you know you need to hear people speaking normally Uh, but also it's quite interesting to just listen to people losing their temper sometimes in another language don't you think Uh, and to just kind of hear what that sounds like what does a heated argument sound like um but yes, I've written no notes or anything in advance, so we're just going to go completely sort of spontaneous on this one. Uh, I have watched both of these clips uh, once before briefly, uh, and so now I'm going to kind of go through them again and kind of discover them uh, again with you. So what we'll do is I'll play a little section of the video, and you have to just listen and try and understand and follow what's going on. And then afterwards, I'll go back and break it down and we'll pick out certain phrases and things and make sure that you understand everything that's going on. OK, um, right. So I think then we can just probably just get started. Right. Let's do that. So I need to just get the video ready. So I'll pause the podcast to do that. OK, so I've queued up the video. What you're going to hear is first the little introduction by Evan Davies, who is uh, you know, introducing the show. He's the host of the show. And he mentions the uh, the economy. Now, this video was uh, published or it was broadcast in 2010. So at that time, we were in the midst of um, a recession uh, due to the banking crisis that happened a couple of years earlier. So that's what he's referring to there. So this is actually from 2010, uh, this episode. Uh, so let's listen to Evan Davies introducing this. And then we will listen to the first uh, pitch by the first person. And 
yeah, you just have to try and understand what's going on, then I'll break it down. So without any further ado, here we go. Welcome back to the Dragon's Den. The economy might be in for a difficult few years, but that doesn't seem to have discouraged the country's entrepreneurs. As ever, they've applied in their droves to come into the den, eager to get a cash injection from our multimillionaire investors. Remember, it's the Dragon's own money on the line, so they'll only invest in the best. The rest will leave empty-handed. So we see uh, our first entrepreneur climbing the steps into the Dragon's Den here. He appears to be holding a road sign under his arm. He's got a few different road signs set up, which he's unveiling. They're kind of covered with some black material. He's assembling them, and he's going to start. My name's Derek Cousins. The company name is Flow Signals. I'm looking for £50,000 for 10% of the equity. This is a no-entry sign. Now, everybody knows what they mean, but some people manage to miss them. So he's actually pointing out uh, a no-entry sign. You know what? I'm not going to interrupt. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. I'm not going to interrupt. I'm going to just play it, and then we'll break it down. Now, that's no big deal if it's just the slip road to the shops. But when it's the slip road to the M4, the M5, or the M8, it's a whole different scenario. Look at them face on, and they're fine. But there are actually very few junctions where you'll see them face on. You see the side on view, which can be extremely limiting. So, we fit a flow signal. It's red in colour. It's mimicking the traffic that is coming towards you. It's visible for 180 degrees. I do have to interrupt, because you can't see that. A flow signal is like a little um, electronic, like LED uh, light display, which is attached to the pole of a street sign. And it's basically a little vertical thing. And it's got three flashing panels on it. And the panels sort of flash in an upward direction, or maybe a downward direction, or maybe a sideways direction. So these little panels of flashing LEDs, that's what a, uh, what does he call it, a flow sign or something? Anyway, that's the thing. It's visible in heavy rain and fog. Turn away and you'll see this in your peripheral vision. You see, this is a 1931 no entry sign and this is a 2010 no entry signal and it's much safer. This is a one way street sign, but what do you see if you go the wrong way? You see nothing. So we fit a flow signal. This time it's angled towards the traffic that's going the wrong way down the road. It's saying to them, here John, you are going the wrong way. You're going, you're going through a strange town. You've never been there before. You're coming to the traffic lights. Turn right. You have to turn right. The one thing you need to know is, is there oncoming traffic? Do I have to give way? But what tells you there's oncoming traffic? Nothing. So we fit a flow signal. Oops. It's gone the way of all demos. So we fit a flow signal. It's amber in colour. It's telling you there is traffic coming into the junction from this direction. Any time that the traffic lights, these traffic lights, are anything other than red, solid red, you will see this burning and turning. You see, once this is fitted, you will not turn right in front of that learner driver who's just found the, the gear. You will not turn right in front of young Susie who's been busy doing her makeup because someone will toot behind her and she'll fly forward straight into you. And you'll wait for that car in the distance because he will be on top of you before you've finished your turn. Thank you for listening. I'm looking for your support to get this project off the ground. There are other applications for these signals as well. Right, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what, 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 what? Oh, this is horrible, is what you... You must be thinking that. I just expect that you're probably thinking, oh, God, this is awful. This is horrible. Um, and yes, it's bad. Okay, it's a bad presentation. The guy doing it is doing quite a bad job. And also, the product itself is pretty bad as well. This is this is not very nice. Now, in the last episode, you heard the dragons sort of interested in doing business with this girl, Kirsty, and her frozen desserts. Um, and they were kind of quite nice, you know, Theopophetus saying he was impressed by her and stuff. But most of the time, remember, this is Dragon's Den. These people are, you know, in, on the show, they are no-nonsense people, and they can be very sort of frank and quite brutal in their feedback and comments. So this is where the dragons really are being dragons, and we'll see how they 
sort of react to this presentation, but this is not good. Let's go through it again, and then we'll break it down. But if you had trouble understanding that, that that's kind of understandable because the bloke was rambling, not, not in a good way. Um, he was rambling, and uh, his examples didn't really make sense. He was quite nervous, so it was a little bit hard to follow what he was saying. Um, so anyway, let's break it down, and let me pause the podcast. Here we go. Okay. Welcome back to the Dragon's Den. The economy might be in for a difficult few years, but that doesn't seem to have discouraged the country's entrepreneurs. The economy may be in for a difficult time for the next few years, but that, has, that doesn't seem to have discouraged the nation's entrepreneurs. To, to encourage, you know, go on, you can do it. Discourage someone. Like, uh, oh, you know, I wouldn't do, ooh, 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 I wouldn't do that. Like the economy might discourage people. Oh, I'm the economy. Oh, oh, uncertain times. Oh, dear. Shifting sands. Uh, anyway, so the economy hasn't discouraged the nation's entrepreneurs. Budding entrepreneurs, does he say? A budding something is like a hopeful, someone who hopes to be something or someone who is 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 sort of in the early stages of becoming something, a budding uh, expert or a budding entrepreneur in this case. As ever, they've applied in their droves to come into the den. They've applied in their droves. Their droves. D-R-O-V-E-S. They're dr- they've applied in their droves. If you describe uh, people as being in their droves, it means a lot. A lot of people. They've applied in their droves means that l- droves of people or lots of people have applied. Eager to get a cash injection from our multimillionaire investors. Eager. Like eager means like very enthusiastic and keen. It's a nice word. Eager. E-A-G-E-R. Eager, keen, enthusiastic to uh, get a cash injection into their business or something. Right. Remember, it's the dragon's own money on the line, so they'll only invest in the best. The rest will leave empty-handed. To leave empty-handed, I guess you can understand that idiom. It means you leave with nothing, literally empty-handed. So here comes, what's his name? I can't remember his name. With his stuff, as he sets it up. Road signs. Hmm. Now remember what uh, I was talking about uh, last episode of the episode before, when it comes to like a SWOT analysis for your business, right? You look at the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So in terms of like this business, it's what is it? Okay, let me explain exactly what it is before we listen to him explain it again. So essentially, he's proposing a system that will replace or maybe add to the existing road sign system that we have. Okay, now that is a system that's been in place for decades, right? I mean, he says it's from the 30s, the design, the original design, but it's been in place for decades. So all the road signs that tell us when to stop, when it's a one-way street, when there's no entry, when you can't enter that street, um, you know, give way, all of the basic things that the road signs tell us to do. He's he's suggesting that these road signs are somehow lacking. Now, I sort of, I'm not sure about that. And then also he's saying that this solution is better. So basically there are these electronic lights, LEDs, these panels that you can put on the uh, signposts. Um, in, it looks like in addition to the existing signs, and they sort of seem to show either red, red lights flowing in one direction or amber lights flowing in another direction. They're a bit sort of vague and confusing, but he's saying that they are a, a better um, alternative to the traditional signs that we have because they catch your eye better is essentially his um, his argument there. So SWOT analysis, strengths of this thing, well, um, I mean, objectively, I'm not sure what the strengths are, except that maybe we could say it's a, it's a system which can help, you know, um, increase road safety maybe. But you need a lot of data, a lot of statistics to back that up, you know, road safety statistics and how many uh, accidents are caused by faulty road signs and things like that. Um, to really establish that your product is a strong proposition in the market. Weaknesses, well, I mean, is it unique? Does the thing have a patent? Is it protected? Is it a unique thing? Or could just anyone stick a light on a a lamppost? Um, uh, Opportunities here, well, I mean, I honestly don't know if there are opportunities for this. Is there there an open door for sort of uh, innovation of road signs? I don't know if this is a this is a thing that's like 
you know, the government or, yeah, the, this isn't something the government are looking for, is it? And um, threats, well, I mean, maybe there's like regulation that determines how road signs are designed and made and that ultimately it's sort of a centralised uh, thing rather than something open to private companies. So it's not sounding great, I think, in my very quick little analysis there. But let's, let's just carry on with this and then we'll see how the dragons respond. My name's Derek Cousins. The company name is Flow Signals. My name's, uh, my name's Derek Cousins. Derek Cousins. It's quite a, I like that name for some reason. My name's Derek Cousins. The company name is Flow Solutions. Flow Solutions? Really? My name's Derek Cousins. The company name is Flow Signals. Flow Signals. Okay, I was going to say, because that's very kind of um, hackneyed now of like, just put solutions at the end of whatever it is. Luke Thompson, uh, Podcast Solutions, uh, you know, just put solutions at the end and it's, but it's no, Flow Signals. Flow Signals, yeah. I'm looking for £50,000 for 10% of the equity. So what's, in his estimation, what's the value of this company? He thinks it's worth £500,000. He thinks this is a half a million pound company he thinks this is a no entry sign so he's he's got a no entry sign red circle with a white hor- uh, horizontal line through it that's a no entry sign in the uk now everybody knows what they mean but some people manage to miss them now th- he's suggesting that some people manage to miss them i don't know if this is true i've never missed a no entry sign I don't know if this is a common cause of accidents, people missing no entry signs. It's not something that people seem to talk about very much, missing no entry signs. So I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that people do miss them. So this is that question of there not really being a need for this. But anyway, let's listen to what he's got to say. Now that's no big deal if it's just the slip road to the shops. But when it's the slip road to the M4, the M5 or the M8, it's a whole different scenario. OK, so at this point... Y- you know, the sort of um, smart dragons will have already picked up that the guy uh, is not really on to a good business here because there's something a bit weird about him as well. I mean, you know, fair enough. He obviously thinks this is a good business, but there's something a bit off. And the way he delivers the lines is, is a little bit strange. There's just like something a little bit strange in his eye. So he's saying... You know, sometimes people miss them and you think, no, they don't. But anyway, um, and that's OK if it's the slip road um, to go to the shops. Right? A slip road is like a small road that comes off a main road. They can have slip roads off the main roads or slip roads onto main roads as well. For example, when you enter the motorway, like the M4, the M6, when you enter the motorway, you enter through a slip road, which is like a small road on the side and then you kind of Um, you blend in with the traffic, you know, you merge with the traffic, that's it. Um, So he's saying it's a slip road, which is okay when you go into the shops, but it's a different story if if it's a slip road uh, onto the M4, the M6 or the M8. But when it's a slip road to the M4, the M5 or the M8, it's a whole different scenario. It's a whole different scenario. And his body language is a bit funny there. He sort of uh, puts his hand in the front of the air. And his eyes go a bit wide. A bit uh, wide. It's a whole different scenario. It's like, oh, okay, could be a nutter. Look at them face on, and they're fine. Look at them face on. So face on it means means you know if you are standing directly in front of the sign, the sign is facing you. It's face on, right? But there are actually very few junctions where you'll see them face on. There are actually very few junctions where you'll see them face on. Now again, I would dispute that because. Normally, road signs point in the direction of the traffic that is going to take that junction or maybe avoid it. So I I suppose if you are right at, I guess when you are right at the front of the traffic lights, sometimes you can't see the traffic lights on the side, especially if you've gone forward a bit too much. But I don't really ever remember not being able to see see the signposts because they're side on. Uh, So again, I don't really agree with that. Look at them face on and they're fine. But there are actually very few junctions where you will see them face on. You see the side on view, which can be extremely limiting. So, we fit a flow signal. It's red in colour. It's mimicking the traffic that is coming towards you. So, we fit a flow signal. Now, this is where it starts to... 
Well, this is where it stops making sense, basically. So we fit a flow signal. It's mimicking the traffic that's moving towards you. All right, so the, the lights move in the direction that the traffic is moving. But surely, or I suppose either you'd see the traffic, but also it's showing you, oh, the traffic moves in this direction. But I'm not sure that's really sort of instinctive enough that you see this line going down, that it's going to be, obviously, that means it's a one-way street. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's the system, it's not just about visibility, when you're um, designing this whole system, it's also about very, very, very clear signalling and exactly what each sign means. And everyone, and any, in any way, everyone has to take the, the, um, you know, your theory t- test, your driving proficiency test. Everyone has to take that. Everyone knows what the signs are. So if you start changing all of that, I mean, it's impossible. The business is simply impossible, I I would imagine, because you can't just start fiddling around with the signs and then you have to change the entire uh, highway code and uh, everyone's got to, what, redo their test? Because how are you going to be sure that people know what all these different flashing lights mean? It's a total disaster. I mean, talk about barriers to to getting onto the market. It's just closed. The the door is closed, surely, for this. Anyway, let's, let's carry on. It's visible for 180 degrees. It's visible in heavy rain and fog. Turn away and you'll see this in your peripheral vision. That is true. It is more visible. That is true. I mean, they're flashing lights, so they are more visible. Fair enough. But I mean, how, also, how do you power them? If these are on every single signpost all over the country, they all have to be electrically connected as well, do they? I mean, what are the overheads here? How much is this going to cost? to to install these everywhere and are they even necessary do we know for sure that signposts are letting us down in terms of safety anyway you see this is a 1931 no entry sign and this is a 2010 no entry signal and it's much safer this is a one-way street sign but what do you see if you go the wrong way you see nothing So he's pointing to another sign, which is a one-way street sign, which is like a little sort of uh, rectangle, um, a vertical rectangle with a blue background and a white arrow pointing uh, in in that direction, meaning it's only a one-way street, okay? So um, he's saying this is a one-way street, but what do you see if you're going the wrong way? You see the back of the sign. Um, Do you? (laughs) Again, do you? Sometimes you see... Um, signs that tell you that you're going the wrong way up a street, I think. But again, it's not a major issue, I think. So we fit a flow signal. This time it's angled towards the traffic that's going the wrong way down the road. It's saying to them, here, John, you are going the wrong way. (laughs) How does it know your name? Here, John, you're going the wrong way. I mean, again, it's just, uh, again, flashing lights like the other one. So I don't know how we are supposed to distinguish the different messages when essentially it's the same lights. I don't get it. You're going, you're going through a strange town. You've never been there before. You're coming to the traffic lights. Turn right. You have to turn right. The one thing you need to know is, is there oncoming traffic? <laughs> oh, my God. The dragons all looked so bored and so uh, annoyed and embarrassed and amused by this. What's that thing he did there? He's like, turn right. What was that? What did he do? Turn right. Yeah, that... <laughs> strange town kingdom you're going through a strange town you've never been there before you get to the traffic lights turn right here john you are going the wrong way you're going you're going through a strange town you've never been there before you're coming to the traffic lights turn right you have to turn right the one thing you need to know is okay i suppose you have to turn right but i don't know why he suddenly goes turn right like that is there oncoming traffic do i have to give way is there oncoming traffic? Do I have to give way? Fair enough. These are the questions you should ask yourself before you turn right at uh, traffic lights. But, I mean, you just look, don't you? I mean, you just have a look and see if the cars are coming. And if you're on a blind corner, then, you know, there are other things. There are often mirrors on those blind corners where you can actually see, you know, those kind of convex mirrors. So you, it allows you to see around the corner. Um, but apparently we need a flow signal there to tell us that there's oncoming traffic coming that... I don't know. You have to turn right. The one thing you need to know is, is there oncoming traffic? Do I have to give way? But what tells you there's oncoming traffic? Nothing. So we fit a flow signal. Oops. 
So this flow signal he's trying to demonstrate doesn't work first, and he makes some kind of comment. This flow signal... It's gone the way of all demos. He said it's gone the way of all demos. It's gone the way of all demos, meaning that the technology's not working. It's like, oh, excruciatingly embarrassing. And you see Theo Pafitis kind of closing his eyes in, in awkwardness as the guy struggles to make the, the, the signal work, which is really not a good sign. No pun intended. So if it, a flow signal, it's amber in colour. It's telling you there is traffic coming into the junction from this direction. Any time that the traffic lights, these traffic lights, are anything other than red, solid red, you will see this burning and turning. I don't know what that means. I really don't understand it. Whenever the traffic lights are anything other than red... So when the traffic lights are, you know, green, when traffic can come through, you see a flow signal that shows you the direction the traffic's coming through. But surely you don't need that. You just know, right, because there are other lights on the junction. So, for example, if you're trying to cross the street, um, or let's say that the, the cars are coming from the side and cars are coming from the front, right? If the cars coming from the front have to stop, then it's cars coming through the sides. So everyone knows which... Uh, you know what all the lights are if you know that this light is green that one must be red so you don't need this this thing showing you the flow of oncoming traffic you see once this is fitted you will not turn right in front of that learner driver who's just found the, the gear you will not turn right in front of that learner driver who's just found the gear Actually, if you do turn right in front of a learner driver that's good because the, the learner driver hasn't found the gear they're not going to crash into you um so it doesn't really make any sense. Maybe, I mean, to be fair, going on Dragon's Den is, must be very, very nerve-wracking and um, stressful. And to be fair to this guy, what was his name? Cousins. Um, I can't remember his um, first name. Derek Cousins, that's it. To be fair to Derek, he's probably nervous. And, I mean, you and I know, don't we, that when you're nervous, you, you just can't sort of string out your sentences properly and it all goes horribly wrong and somehow your brain kind of farts all the time and nothing it just nonsense comes out and it's horrible well that's what's happening here but i mean again what about the business i mean there's the presentation that might go wrong maybe he's getting his metaphors mixed up or he's getting his examples wrong but what about the actual substance of the business i think we've already decided that it's it's an it's a non-starter uh, but I can't wait for what the dragons are going to say. You will not turn right in front of young Susie, who's been busy doing her makeup, because someone will toot behind her and she'll fly forward. Right, OK. That, at this point, you were probably thinking, I've got no idea what he's saying. But he's saying you will not turn right in front of a girl who's putting her makeup on or something? Turn right in front of young Susie, who's been busy doing her makeup, because someone will toot behind her and she'll fly forward. You won't turn right in front of Susie, who's been busy doing her makeup, and some will, someone will toot like, beep, beep, someone will toot behind her and she'll f go forwards. I don't know what he's talking about. Why is this a problem if you're trying to turn right? Um, I don't get it. I mean, we've already got road signs and um, traffic lights that do an ample job. I don't know what he's talking about with Susie and her makeup and people. I've no idea. Straight in. Uh, but I tell you what, the, the dragons are going to eat him for breakfast, let me tell you. I, as I said, I've watched this once before, and they they are quite brutal with him. I mean, on one hand, they're they're giving him a healthy healthy dose of reality, and actually giving some serious and sincere advice. But also, it's pretty brutal feedback, as you're going to hear. So, if you've got sympathy for Derek's uh, cousins, then well, I mean, good. I mean, uh, he he will need it because they're going to sort of. Um, go to town on him a little bit here but maybe they're right because frankly this business is really no good and he should probably move on to something else right i mean he shouldn't waste any more of his time or money on it surely didn't you and you'll wait for that car in the distance because he will be on top of you before you've finished your turn thank you for listening i'm looking for your support to get this project off the ground there are other applications for these signals as well An ambitious proposal from Hertfordshire inventor Derek Cousins. He wants to revolutionise the nation's existing traffic signs and signals, but to do it needs a £50,000 investment from the Dragons. Peter Jones just looks bewildered.
I don't even know. I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not even sure I know what it is. But what I do see is a flow flashing light. Right. On a sign. Yeah. Has it cost you a lot of money to do? Um, about twenty-four thousand pounds so far. Yeah. Twenty-four thousand pounds. Yeah. Are you are you, uh, serious about this? Yes. Go on. What's what yeah. a flashing light on a on a pole? Yeah. Yes, I'm serious about this. But wouldn't? <laughs> Can I please? It's not often I say yeah, this. Go on. Could one of the other dragons please interrupt me? Oh, um, hello, Derek. <laughs> hello, <It's> Deborah. <laughs> Derek, um, have you had this approved? No. But something needs to be done because... So, at the moment, you have absolutely no idea because you know there's very strict regulation. Oh, yes, I know that. But you haven't done anything at all about it? Oh, no, I've, I've, the, the lady who runs the signs and signals doesn't like the idea. So. She doesn't like the idea. <laughs> oh, <laughs> OK, Derek. all right, well, another dragon, <laughs> please interrupt me. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> it's not good, is it? I mean, basically, as you heard there in that, that exchange, uh, Peter uh, desperately needs one of the other dragons to interrupt him because he just doesn't know what to say next. Uh, Deborah asks about whether or not um, he's had this system approved because surely if you have a system that's potentially going to be used nationwide, it needs to be improve, uh, approved by the uh, relevant regulatory body, right? So he's said... Um, uh, the the woman who's in charge of like a uh, signage or something doesn't like it, so that's really not a good thing. First of all, he hasn't had it approved, and secondly, the woman responsible for that doesn't like the project. So, I mean, that's that's terrible, isn't it? Let's face it. Let's go back through those bits. Um, it was just about a minute's worth. Here we go. All right. Well, another dragon. <laughs> please interrupt me. All right. Yeah. A little bit further back. Here we go. I don't even know. I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not even sure I know what it is. But That's quite clear, isn't it? I'm not even sure I know what it is. I mean, I'm not even sure I know what it is. Is it just some flashing lights? What I do see is a flow flashing light. Right. On a sign. Yeah. Has it cost you a lot of money to do? Um, about £24,000 so far. Yeah. Twenty. <sighs> Twenty. It's cost him £24,000 so far to do this. Oh, my word. £4,000. Yeah. Are you, are you are serious about this? Yes, go on. What's, what yeah. a flashing light on a, on a pole. Yeah. A flashing light on a pole. A pole, you know, like a telegraph pole or a, uh, a pole that you would fix a sign to. Yeah. Yes, I'm serious about this. But wouldn't... <laughs> Can I please... It's not often I say yeah, this. Could one of the other dragons please interrupt me? <laughs> Could one of the other dragons please interrupt me? It's not often I say this. Oh, um, hello, Derek. <laughs> hello, it's Deborah. Derek, um, have you had this approved? Right, have you had this approved? No. <laughs> I love the way he's just like, no. <laughs> but something needs to be done because... So at the moment you have absolutely no idea because you know there's very strict regulation. Oh yes, I know that. But you haven't done anything at all about it. Oh, no, I've, I've, the, the lady who runs the signs and signals doesn't like the idea. <laughs> the lady who runs the signs and signals doesn't like the idea. So that's it, isn't it? I mean, there's that one single person that you need to convince, right? If there's just one person that's, that's going to make or break your business and she doesn't like it. She doesn't like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Derek. All right. Well, another dragon. <laughs> Please interrupt me. Not a great start for the inventor. Perhaps Theopophetus can bring some order to proceedings. Uh, Derek, yeah, I'm going to give you fifty thousand pounds. Yeah. How am I going to make a profit from it? Well, because we'll be selling these these signs worldwide, and no one else will be able to do these. Yeah, I've got a pattern on it. So he's like, and, and no one else will be able to do these. Yeah, I've got a pattern on it. So he says he's got a pattern. you got a pattern for? Because it's a, a, a good idea. No, 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 they, no. Right, to get a pattern, as I said before, you need a genuine inventive step. It's got to be something that no one's done before. So I wonder if maybe putting, I mean, lights, flashing lights, LEDs that flow in a certain direction. No, you can't patent that. That's obviously been done before. Sticking that on a road sign, 
Is that a genuine inventive step? Maybe if you've got specific programs that uh, sort of um, have designed the way in which the lights flow, and that's specific to the application in a road traffic situation. I don't know why I said it like that at the end, but I did. Maybe that is specific enough. But mm, I wonder. I wonder if he's got a patent. I remember last time watching this, thinking, "Bullshit! Has he got a patent?" But what have you got a patent for? For for what? For using a display, which display? You see. It's mimicking the traffic that's coming towards you. It's red. It's highly visible. You'll see it in your peripheral vision. So when you're coming along, instead of missing the no-entry signs, which are up too high, which you can't see at the right angle... So this is not the answer that you want when you ask if it's got a patent. Because when you say to someone, yeah, uh, has your product got a patent? They say, yes, you know, I've registered the filing at this time, blah blah. They actually go through the, the details of the patent they've got. Instead, he's trying to convince Theo that the product should have a patent by just sort of going on again about stuff. It's visible. You can see it from 180 degrees. Uh, it, fl- it mimics the direction of the oncoming traffic. You will see this in your eye. What is it that you've got a patent on? If you can it's, tell it's me. On, it's on these signs and their, their, their deployment for, for road safety applications. It's to do with mimicking traffic coming yep. towards you. Derek, listen. Yeah. Answer this question truthfully. You can't really think you can get a patent for flashing lights to stick on poles and make a fortune. This is Duncan Bannatyne again. I'm not going to do his accent because I can't. Uh, I cannot do it, Captain. Uh, what was that, Luke? Star Trek. Never mind. So he's saying, y- "Are you serious? You you seriously can't uh, get a patent for a flashing light on a pole, right? For flashing lights to stick on poles and make a fortune? Yes, I do." Derek's steadfast belief in his product may be admirable, but that's not enough for Peter Jones. His steadfast belief in his product may be admirable. Oh, my goodness. Such lovely, lovely vocab. Uh, Steadfast, sort of firm, like strong. You don't move. You just stand in your position like Gandalf, you know. You shall not get an investment in your business. Um, Steadfast. He's steadfast. What was it? Fast belief in his product may be admirable. It's admirable, meaning you can admire it, right? I mean, he's got steadfast belief in his product, and you know, you sort of you could admire him for that. But but that's not enough for Peter Jones. One thing that worries me: you spent twenty-four thousand pounds. Yes, I need you. On all seriousness, this needs to be your wake-up moment. One thing that worries me: you spent. One thing that worries me. One thing that worries me: you've spent. £24,000. One thing that worries me... £24,000. One thing that worries me, you spent £24,000. Yes. I need you... On all seriousness, this needs to be your wake-up moment. In all seriousness, this needs to be your wake-up moment. The moment when you wake up. It's a wake-up call. This will save lives. This will not save it lives will. at all. It and in sa- fact, it could even be a major distraction if we're going to get serious. I mean, that's a fair point as well. I know that we're dealing with a guy who's put his life, his passion, his work into this stuff. But, I mean, that is a f- actually a fair point. Rather than saving lives, these things could be so confusing that it actually could could cause some people to have accidents. That's a very serious thing. So, yeah, it is a wake-up call. And this is quite hard feedback that he's receiving here. It's tough. But I think it's fair, don't you? These signs have been in existence for a long time. Been in the, the highway the code has been in existence much. for a long time. Yeah. We all know it. We all get it. Do not spend one more pound trying to push this into the marketplace. This is ridiculous. And for that reason, I'm out. Okay, fine. Derek, can I ask you, has anybody told you they think this is a good idea? Any chief constables? Any, any, anybody no, who can actually possibly any. have any influence at all no. on them ever, ever, ever being used or sold. Well, can I explain a little bit? Yes or no? Just give me some names. No, No. I haven't got any names to give you. So the answer is nobody. The answer's nobody. So you stand in front of us with the person who's going to make a decision on whether or not they're introduced, telling you categorically, this is not going to happen, I do not like it. And I sit here smiling, and then I get serious. I have never met you in my life before. I am pleading with you not to do it. Won't affect my life at all but it is going to affect your life. Well, can I, can I finish telling you about the, the no. traffic light incident? No, yeah? 
No, you can't. Well, you can then, but you can't tell me because I'm not at all interested. I'm out. Wow. I mean, Deborah Meaden is known for being very sort of um, blunt, straight talking, common sense. But uh, again, I mean, it's fair enough. She she's questioning sort of uh, his reasons for coming into the den, even though he knows that the woman in charge of actually implementing this thing doesn't want to to do it. She doesn't like it. So, uh, yeah, fair enough. Deborah Meaden's out. But she's also pleading with Derek to actually stop doing this, which, again, I think is probably the right advice because I can't see this going anywhere. I'm struggling, Derek. I've been driving for 30 years and yeah. I've never not recognised the no-entry sign. You know, are, well, you, are well, you trying to solve... I know you haven't missed them, but people do miss them. Look in your highway code. There is no wrong-way sign in the UK. I'm just going to let you hear... I'm out. I'm out. All right, James Kahn is out. A remarkably composed Derek sees three dragons walk away from the deal. He's remarkably composed, meaning he's still got the same sort of composure that he had before, which is kind of like, well, surprising, considering the things that have been said to him. I think Duncan is going to be a bit mean now. And Theo Pafitis is in a minute. now ready to have his say. It isn't going to work. Give it up. No. Derek. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm out. OK, would, would you listen to me, Duncan, for five minutes? I'll listen to you, Derek. Thank you. All right. There's another application which is, this also addresses, and one is that when you're in a car park and you're looking for the exit sign, the one thing, you, the one thing you've got is that your eyes, you look yeah. around, you're looking for that, that arrow sign. Yeah. And if you have it going red... So what happens is that when, when all the arrows are all covered in snow and... <sighs> what is he going on about? It's kind of like word salad. If you, you're eyes in a car park... Right. Do you, know, do you know the concept of word salad? That's where you just kind of like throw loads of sort of phrases and things together that sound like they mean something, but actually they don't really. And you can kind of do word salad. If you're doing a Paul McCartney impression, you can sort of do word salad. You know, people sometimes say, you know, you were in the Beatles. And I kind of think to myself, was I in the Beatles? That's amazing. You know, I just remember going into the studio, you know, lay down a little bit of bass, you know, and that was very John, that sort of thing, you know. So um, that's kind of like word salad. And Trump does word salad too. It's like totally terrific. Believe me, folks, I know the greatest or the greatest uh, roadside technology. Uh, we're going we're gonna to make tremendous changes. It's going to be fantastic. Um, so that's kind of like word salad as well. This guy is doing word salad, which is uh, what, what's the word salad he's doing? It's kind of like, well, you know, when you are leaving a car park, and you're looking around for that uh, that arrow sign. Uh, with these, they they mimic the direction of the oncoming traffic. And when there's snow, like what are you talking about? There's another application which this also addresses. And one is that when you're in a car park and you're looking for the exit sign, the one thing you the one thing you've got is that your eyes. You look yeah. around. You're looking for that that arrow sign. Yeah. And if you have it going red, so what happens is that when when all the arrows are all covered in snow and you can't see any of the arrows or they, they've worn out or you can't see you'll look down one way and you'll see the red going down the way and you'll see the the, the, the green and the blue the other way telling you that the green <laughs> oh my god there's blue in there now as well so there were red lights there were green lights and amber lights as well and now there's a blue light like you're introducing a whole another color oh mate what does blue mean taking you towards the exit and the blue taking you towards mole parking Derek, i said i'd listen to you because i wanted didn't want to be impolite. Um, is there much more? Well, I, I, was, I hadn't really finished explaining about the traffic light problem. Duncan's going to be mean to him now. Maybe a little bit unnecessary, but there it is. You win the worst invention ever to be brought into Dragon's Den today. Really? Um, the prize is yours. And Derek, I'm out. Thank, thank you. you. Going from the left-hand side, you look at the no-entry sides and see how easy it is for you to miss them. Derek, Derek. Thank you. Thank that you. way. Derek, that way. Done there. There's a sign there, that way. <laughs> oh, 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 dear. It's- Brutal. Do you hear that joke from the Opafetus? They're like, go that way, please. They're trying to get him to leave. And it's like, this, there's a moment there where you think, oh, my God, he's not going to leave. He's just going to keep going on and on about road signs. And they're like, you know, Derek, thank you. Which, I don't know if it's the same everywhere, but if you say, look, thank you that means go away you know and so they're like the the over there please look there's a sign over there oh cold <laughs> but there you go apparently the worst ever product to appear on dragon's den i don't know if 
Maybe that's true, I don't know, but there have been some pretty terrible products on this show over the years. It's a swift exit for Derek. These dragons don't waste time when they can't see an opportunity. Okay, so I told you that there was another one. All right, now we're we're about 45 minutes of the way into this now, but I do want to do the other uh, pitch that I mentioned before. So here it is. Okay, I'm just trying to find the right moment in the video for this. So the pitch that you're going to see now, and I actually thought this would be an interesting one. First of all, because the, the, the presenter gets extremely nervous. And so it's a, a chance for us to just consider what you can do when you're doing a presentation and you're feeling nervous and you suddenly block up, like you kind of, your mind goes blank or you feel so nervous that you can't speak, that you can't kind of really do anything. You can't even really breathe. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I've experienced things like that, having been a teacher for a long time, certainly in the, the first few years of being a teacher, there were moments where I suddenly got very nervous, like in front of maybe a new class, in t- teaching a class that I wasn't very confident about, or moments in those classes where there were, for example, language questions that, to be honest, I couldn't answer there and then, and that I felt that I had to answer for my students. So there have been moments when I felt very nervous doing speaking stand-up comedy sometimes if it doesn't go well if you get sort of silence from uh, the room then that can make you do that too and it can everything breaks down and you're not able to speak so what about you have you ever had an experience like that where you've done a presentation and you get horribly nervous when does it happen let's let's listen i need to just find the right place okay i found the right part of the video and um so what is this so we'll just listen to Evan Davies, just introduce it. Then we'll listen to the the pitch. And there will be moments of silence, like there were in the last episode. There are going to be, going to be some moments of silence. And that is when the entrepreneur doing his presentation is basically um, sort of having a nervous moment and is unable to talk. Maybe he's forgotten what he's saying. I don't know. But he's overcome with nerves and he's not really able to to do it but he manages to get a grip on himself and then carry on and then we get the rest of the the negotiation with some discord like i said uh, at the beginning so this is a wine business okay it's a wine business and i'll let you find out the details for yourself but also i'd like you to consider when do people get nervous like that and uh, are unable to speak? When does that happen? What are the conditions that lead that to happen? And also, another thing for you, imagine you had to do a presentation, okay? Like, I asked you to do a presentation next week for 10 minutes. How would you prepare it? What would you actually do to prepare for that presentation? And what would be the steps involved before you actually get up and stand, get up, stand up like Bob Marley and do your presentation? like Bob Marley. That would be good. In fact, um, you could do it like Bob Marley, but that would also be weird because you'd you'd arrive dressed as Bob Marley and everyone would be like, why are you dressed as Bob Marley? And you'd say, because I'm going to get up, stand up and do my presentation. And they'd say, that's terrible. That's lame. Get out. Uh, I never come here again. So don't do that. Uh, But anyway, so uh, yes, what are the steps involved? What, What things would you do to prepare your presentation? And how do you think that would uh, have an impact on the actual uh, moment when you have to deliver the presentation to your audience? Okay, so what's this business then, first of all? And then what makes people get nervous? The dragons are often intrigued by an unusual investment possibility, but it's a credible business plan which will help turn their interest into hard cash. Next up is former environmental consultant Jeff Bowen, has he done enough preparation to persuade them to invest in his Devon-based business? Okay, Devon-based business down in the southwest of England. He arrives in the den with what looks like a bottle of sparkling wine in a bucket, probably with ice. And he unveils a selection of other bottles of what looked like sort of something like champagne, but uh, made in England. And in fact, the bottles have all got the names of the dragons on them, which is quite a nice touch. There's also a map of, of like a, a vineyard and some other materials there. A photograph of a vineyard, not a map. Hello. Very nice to meet you all. My name is Jeff Bowen. I have an award-winning organic vineyard near Tuexter in Devon. 
and I'm looking for £60,000 for 20% of my new vineyard experience business, Pebble Bed Partner Vineyards. The, 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 um, many people have, have the dream of having their own vineyard, but few will actually achieve that, mainly due to cost, time taken, the experience needed. Imagine drinking your own wine with your own label, a little bit like these, having had a part in actually planting those vines, nurturing them, and making the wine. In return for nine and a half thousand pounds, partners will actually receive 60 bottles of sparkling wine with their own name on it. 600 bottles of sparkling wine over the period of the lease. So in effect, uh, the cost for a bottle of sparkling wine is about 20 pounds. In the first year, I intend to have a five acre piece of land, purchase that next to my existing vineyard, and divide that into 20 smaller parcels. What I'd like from yourselves as dragons is to actually provide the seed capital to buy the land and to fund the marketing of the vineyard parcels. But just before I take any questions, I would like to offer you, please, a glass of our sparkling. It's very important you actually taste the product. Let me just tell you where I am, Jeff. I can't invest in alcohol-related products because of religious reasons, and so I'm going to declare myself out, Jeff. OK, I understand. Okay, so James Kahn there just declaring himself out, of course, because of religious reasons. He uh, can't invest in alcohol-related products. All right, so it's just four dragons then for this one. So what is it? Actually, uh, to be completely honest with you, I'm not 100% sure I understand the business model here. I think it's something along the lines of selling plots uh, of land, which he'll be using to grow uh, wine, right? To grow grapes, vines, to make wine. And the people who've bought those plots, they get a certain number of bottles of wine um, per year. And the wine bottles also have their names on it, which is quite a nice touch. I think that's it. And I, um, like my wife actually uh, last year did a similar thing for me, but it wasn't wine, it was honey. So she bought, she kind of basically paid some money to a local farmer outside Paris. um, And uh, essentially, I mean, in theory, I have my own patch of meadow which uh, the bees, uh, you know, use to feed on the flowers and stuff. And then uh, the honey that they make is, you know, sourced from this particular meadow of which I own a small plot. I don't actually own it. That's the thing. I don't own anything. I just kind of contributed to uh, the upkeep of this meadow, which was then used by the bees to make their honey. And then I get like a big pack, a huge box of honey at the end of the year. So it's a similar thing to this, I think, um, somehow. I'm not sure of all the ins and outs. Right. So that's kind of the business. People uh, pay a certain amount to maybe rent or buy a plot of land which is being used to make wine, and they receive a certain number of bottles of sparkling wine every year uh, in return. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, I'm not sure of all the details. We'll find them out. What about the bit where he got nervous, though? Because you heard him suddenly go quiet, uh, moments of silence there, and he was like trying to get his thoughts together. He tried to start again a couple of times and failed. So what's going on there? So before I asked you to think about doing presentations and how you prepare for them. Now, the reason I said that is because I think this guy, um, I think that he had a script in his head, a script that he wrote before. So I expect that when he did his presentation, he sat down and he wrote the presentation out on his computer or by hand or something. So he had a script and then he remembered the script. But, and that's what so many people do. But I think it's a mistake. You shouldn't do that. I think instead what you should do is, pr- uh, instead of writing it on paper, you sort of write it in your head. And you do that by just doing the presentation over and over again. You might write down the key bits of information that you need to get across, right? The absolute essential things you need to say, you might note those things down, but the actual sort of word by word stuff, you can just make that up as you go along. Uh, Don't improvise it, obviously, when you do it for real, but you practice and practice and practice doing the presentation again and again with your voice, not with your hand. And then uh, when when you come to do it for real, it'll just come out much more naturally. Uh, So that's a much more effective way. Um, When people try to remember a pre-written script, they 
often forget it. I've seen it so many times. Uh, people coming up, um, trying to uh, like repeat a, a script that they've remembered in their head, and often they just can't remember it one line. And because they can't remember that one line, the whole thing uh, goes pear shaped. So I think that's what happened to him. I'd also quite like to add here um, something about his breathing. If you notice from that clip that he doesn't really breathe or he's, he's completely constricted. In fact, he tries to take a breath and he can't. And in fact, he's kind of stuck or stunned because he's not breathing properly. And, you know, you hear people talking about the importance of breathing when doing public speaking and things. It's really vital. For me, it's a great way to try and deal with nerves. Take a nice deep breath from the diaphragm, you know, that sort of part between your sort of lungs and the bottom part of your body. And just a real deep breath so your stomach comes out. In through the nose like that. And that's a great way of just sort of like actually getting a grip on yourself. It's when you sort of start doing that shallow breathing that uh, you can't, you get locked, you get constricted and you can't get out of it. So it's important if you do get locked up and you feel nervous, big deep breath in through the nose and that helps. So anyway, I don't think we need to listen to that. Do we need to listen to that little bit? I'd like to just listen to what he said about the business model there. Uh, so let's hear that again. I'm gonna... Okay, so he's all nervous, but he's about to come back. Many people have have the dream of having their own vineyard, but many people have the dream of having their own vineyard, right? Lots of people would love to have their own vineyard. Few will actually achieve that, mainly due to cost, the time taken, the experience needed. But few will have that dream because of all the cost, the time taken, the experience you need. Blah blah blah. Imagine drinking your own wine with your own label, a little bit like these. Imagine drinking your own wine with your own label, a little bit like these. Not a bad, not a bad uh, prospect, I suppose, but I don't really need my own name on my own bottle of wine. Although, if it is my own wine, in the sense that it was grown on my own vines, on my own little plot of land, that would be pretty good. And if it had my name on it, that would be nice as well, wouldn't it? Having had a part in actually planting those vines, nurturing them and making the wine... In return for nine and a half thousand pounds, partners will actually receive 60 bottles of sparkling wine with their own name on it. Nine and a half thousand pounds, they'll get 60 bottles. So nine and a half divided by 60 is, it's like pay, what? Get out of town. Nine and a half thousand pounds is what they pay and they get 60 bottles in return. That's like 158 pounds a bottle. No, I must have got something wrong. 600 bottles of sparkling wine over the period of the lease. Okay, 600. So it's actually divided by 600. But every year you get, um, um, yeah, you get 60. Six, 500 divided by 600. And it's going to be a, what, a 15, yeah. So Okay, 15 quid for a bottle of sparkling wine. Is it any good? Is the sparkling wine any good? You, some of you will be thinking, oh, English wine. Actually, I'll have you know that English sparkling wine is uh, is award winning, and that's true. Okay, so yeah, we don't do other types of wine, but sparkling wine are actually pretty good. There are some regions in the south of England where uh, the soil is really good for doing sparkling wine, and we've we've won some awards. Some of our vineyards have won awards for their sparkling wine, so it's not bad actually. So you've got you know what is it, Cava in Spain and. Prosecco in Italy and Champagne in France. And we have, well, I don't know what we call it, English sparkling wine in, um, in England. So in effect, uh, the cost for a bottle of sparkling wine is about £20. Oh, £20. 15 20 uh. In the first year, I intend to have a five-acre piece of land, purchase that next to my existing vineyard, and divide that into 20 smaller parcels. What I- Wait, 20 smaller parcels? So he's going to get 9,500 times 20. Doesn't seem that much, does it? It's 190,000, okay, is what he might get in terms of turnover. Uh, is that next year? I think it is. I'd like from yourselves as dragons is to actually provide the seed capital to buy the land and to fund the marketing of the vineyard parcels. So he needs the land first before he can like resell that to these partners and then the... Um what, what was it? Buy the land and to fund the marketing of the vineyard parcels. Right, to market it. It's probably like a package that you could buy, maybe as a gift or something. But still, 9,500 £9, pounds is quite a lot to pay up front. 
don't you think, to be, is it a 10-year period? You get 60 bottles of sparkling wine for 10 years. It's one hell of a commitment for, for, that, for that long. I mean, I'm not sure I'd want to commit. Like, yes, I will definitely drink 60 bottles of sparkling wine a year for 10 years. And that's like, that's more than one a week. <laughs> You've got to love English sparkling wine to become a partner in this. He needs 20 partners. I suppose it's doable. There doesn't seem to be a lot of money to be made. But just before I take any questions, I would like to offer you, please, a glass of our sparkling. It's very important you actually taste the product. All right. A shaky pitch and the loss of a dragon. A disastrous start for any entrepreneur. Jeff Bowen wants £60,000 to give wine lovers the chance to rent their own vineyard. And he's offering 20% equity in return. £60,000 for 20% equity. OK. Marvellous. Thank you, what? Now, they're all trying the uh, sparkling wine. Will the remaining multi-millionaires make of it? Except for James Kahn, of course. Yes, hold um, Jeff, you're absolutely right. People have this romantic dream of having their own wine for their own vineyards. So for my nine and a half thousand pounds... Yes. I get 60 bottles of... Champagne. Yes. Well, we can't say just sparkling white wine. Sparkling wine. Thank you. Equal to champagne, in my we, view. We do not want to upset the French, do we? <laughs> um, I get 60 bottles a year. For how long? For 10 years. 10 years. And what more do I get? You come and plant the vines, if you would like to, for an hour or a day or a week, if you want and to. How many vines do I get? You get uh, a quarter of an acre worth, 250 vines. You bring anybody down at any time you want to. You come to our cellar, where we can serve those wines with local foods. Uh, and this scheme gives people the opportunity who don't have a lot of money to, to have their own vineyard. Actually, I mean, if you've got £9,500 to play with and you always wanted to have your own vineyard and you want to drink 60 bottles of English sparkling wine a year for the next 10 years, then this might be for you. I mean, it does sound like quite a nice experience, I have to say, uh, that you get the chance to plant your vines if you want to. And you can also come down and enjoy the experience of like drinking the wine with some food that they've put on for you as well. It does sound like quite a nice sort of partnership to to belong to. But it's quite niche, I think. I mean, very specific market. It's quite a uh, niche market. An intriguing proposition, perhaps. But does it stack up? Hotelier Duncan Bannatyne wants to focus on the product itself. OK, let's find out about this wine then. You said it was as good as champagne. In my opinion. And your opinion. And men- many but others as you're well. You're not fermenting it using the same method. Yes, exactly the same method. Traditional method. The method champagne? Yep, and that's spent 18 months on lees. So it really is champagne apart from the name. Oh, very much so. And, and, you know, the French are buying up land in England at the moment t- because they believe it's, we have a potentially better climate. The French are buying... I love the way his sentence goes up. The French are buying land in England at the moment because they think we've got a potentially better climate. No, the French are buying up land in England at the moment t- because they believe it's... We're going to go up and up and up and up and this sentence is never going to end. No. Oh, very much so. And, and, you know, the French are buying up land in England at the moment t- because they believe it's... We- oh, my goodness. The French are buying up land at the moment because they believe... Is he, is he commenting on a horse race? And the French are buying up land at the moment and because they believe this is the right market. We have a potentially better climate. So what would happen whilst the new vineyard or the new acres weren't making money? Well, then- Sorry, Duncan, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> whilst the new vineyard or the new acres weren't making money. Uh, hold on a minute, Duncan. Sorry. You're speaking to non-nat- non-native speakers of English here. I'm afraid you're going to have to just uh, say that again. What so. was in England at the moment? T- because oh, they- my God. Here he goes again. Yeah, apart from the name, oh, very much oh, so. And, and, you know, the French are buying up whoa, land whoa, in England whoa, at the whoa, moment whoa, whoa, t- because whoa. they believe it's... We have uh, a- oh, my God. It's just... <laughs> the sentence keeps going up and up and up. Potentially better climate. OK. So what would happen whilst the new vineyard or the new acres weren't making money what would happen whilst the new vineyard the new acres were not making money so now we're going to get down into the actual nitty-gritty of the business i think the ins and outs of the business what would happen what happens then when the new uh, acres are not making money all right that's quite a good point because how long does it take a vine to start producing wine that you can then make profit from well the new vineyards make money from day one. Oh, okay because we already have two people who have signed up. I thought you had to plant them. Yes. Oh, you mean the money from the people? The money comes in. The, the beauty of this scheme is you get the money right. ahead. Okay. 
All right, so the money's already come in because the people have paid the nine thousand five hundred. Um, so that's where the that's where the money's coming from. But I guess what Duncan was referring to is the fact that the uh, the plots of land. How long does it take for them to yield um, actual product? Okay. With my okay. existing vineyard, it's taken me seven years to actually get to a break-even ski- position. Wait, his existing vineyard has taken him seven years to get to a break-even position. That's not a very good sign. That means that for seven years, he's not been making profit. Learning from experience goes down well. with. But, all right, learning from experience. It's, to me, it sounds like, I suppose it's being presented as a, re, you know, like, look of all the experience I've got. But it also seems to suggest that seven years of not making any profit. But does that mean now that his sort of vineyards are now great? I don't really get that bit. With these dragons. Now, de- how about you folks? Are you doing all right out there in podcast land? Are you following this? We've been doing this for about an hour and five minutes. Are you still there, ladies and gentlemen? Do you know? Do you want to know what's going to happen to Jeff and his business um, as we sort of start to get uh, into the details of his actual business plan? Deborah Meaden wants to interrogate Jeff on his business plan. Now, Deb, I'm impressed by Deborah Meaden. All right, I'm actually very impressed by her. I follow her on Twitter as well, and she's a very impressive person who's kind of able to uh, put things very clearly and without any uh, fuss or... He's very straightforward, down-to-earth and clear, which is very refreshing. She's going to really kind of uh, um, analyse Jeff's business plan here. She really wants to get to the bottom uh, of it, and she he has to know his figures. Hello, Jeff. I'm Deborah. Very nice to me. Um, let me understand something. Are you saying that you have 20 plots, each of who pay £9,500? What's the maximum return I can get on that? In the first year, at 20% ownership, you will get £7,000 return. First year, you get £7,000 return. It's not a very good return for the first year. Um, how does that work? Uh, our gross profit is £46,000. Our net profit is £35,000, so 20% of £35,000 is £7,000. You get no more income from that land, land except you own the land. Um, you just get 7000 from that land. What? So, hmm. you get 20% of the money you make from that plot. So the dragons get 20% of the money that they make from each plot. And after all the other stuff's been taken away, the net profit is £35,000. 20% of that is £7,000. So is it just 7000 times 20, right? £7,000 return on investment per plot, and there's 20 plots. So that results in 140000 Okay, after they've given him 60000 So that's, I, you know, not too bad. That's, you know, £80,000 return on investment. And since all of the, the, the costs are all fixed, all they need to do is get those 20 people. It seems to make sense. So, in year two, I get nothing. From that existing From land. That existing land. In year three, I get nothing. In year four, I get nothing. How do I get my money back? Oh, it's a good point. So, the, the, the thing there is that there's no kind of onward return. You get one single return on investment from the sale of each of those 20 plots, right? So you, the max you're ever going to get is 80,000 in year one, assuming all 20 are sold in the first year, right? But Deborah obviously wants to keep making money in year two and year three. So she's going, where, where am I going to get all my other money from? So basically she's arguing about the fact that the money, the money doesn't keep coming in. Um, your money will come back because it's, it's, it's in, the, in, in the initial um, income. In the first year, we will have 20 people paying me £9,500. That is £190,000 in income. Yeah, got that. We will have costs, total costs, to do this project of £144,000. Got that. Ooh, that's a lot of costs. So it's £190,000 you get from the whole 20 plots. Cost of 140 something thousand pounds, that's a lot. Uh, 144,000 pounds of costs includes 35,000 pounds for the purchase of land. 
£35,000 for the purchase of the land. All right, okay, okay, that's what he needs the investment for, yeah. Which is your investment. And £15,000, which is your investment for admin, marketing and legals. Yeah. To plant the vineyards, 40000 Yeah. And £54,000 yeah. for the initial three years of wine. Actually, he does know his numbers, which is pretty good. But Deborah seems confused by something. Because you won't get any wine from your own vines for the first three years. Sorry, <laughs> how have I had my £60,000 back? Because people will have paid me, 100, us, £190,000. You can take that investment straight back. You can't. You can't. You can't. You've spent, spent it, it on everything. You've just told us what you spent it on. At what point? Oh, what? So he's not taking into account the fact that... Oh, it's confusing. Have... I, I, mm. So he's talking about, first of all, 190000 Then he goes into all the details of the things that they're going to spend, right? Um, £60,000 of that is covered by the investment that they're going to get. Yeah, all right. So there's £190,000 um, from sales. And then on top of that, there's the investment amount, which is £60,000. So it rounds up to £250,000. I think the, the dragons are forgetting that £190,000 doesn't include the £60,000 investment as well. Isn't that what's going on here? We, the, we hand the cash over. We don't own the £35,000 worth of land. Yes, understand. you do. We immediately own 20% yes. of the 35000 So stop nodding and saying, yes, you do own it. I, I don't. I understand why they don't get it, Jeff. It's I easy. own 20%. Well, I don't, Duncan. Easy. So well, I'm gonna can keep, I explain it? Dun- so, all right, so I'm not going to interrupt this bit, but basically you just need to know that Duncan thinks it's easy. He's worked it out. Deborah doesn't. She wants to know from Jeff uh, the answers to her questions about his uh, figures and stuff. Duncan thinks he's worked it out, but Deborah's trying to shut Duncan up. For, she's trying to stop him from interrupting because she needs to know it from Jeff because, you know, obviously she needs to know that he knows his own business. But there's quite a nice heated exchange going on here between Deborah stopping Duncan from interrupting and then uh, cross-examining Jeff. And again, Deborah Meaden, very impressive individual. Listen to the way she deals with Duncan Bannatyne. And this is, you know, a good example of how you stop someone interrupting you, I would say. Do own it. I, I don't. I don't. Some... They own twenty yes. percent of the thirty-five. That so stop nodding and saying yes, you do own it. I don't. I don't, don't. don't get it, Jeff. It's I easy. own twenty percent. Well, I don't, Duncan. So well, I'm can keep... I explain it, Duncan? No, no. Well, we have an income. Oh, no, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. No, Duncan. I'm. So Duncan is standing up now. He's going over to stand with uh, Jeff. Not investing in you. He's just a 60. Duncan, seriously, this is not... You're not helping him because I'm not going to invest in him if you are going to have to go over and show him your numbers. Oh, is that obvious? He says... No, no, get... not obvious, Duncan. But I don't want to hear your explanation. Over. Because I, you Duncan, said we're going to get 180,000 pounds from the sales of the line. I am not interested in your explanation and over pounds Jeff's at 250. numbers. I'm not looking to invest in you. So I want to know from you, Jeff, how you think I'm going to get my money back. Wow, she's really good. And... Um, I guess what she's done there is, uh, like the, I mean, I'm not the greatest at like sort of uh, uh, these kinds of um, uh, serious uh, discussions where people are sort of disagreeing with each other strongly like this. But in terms of stopping someone interrupting you, the main thing is you've got to keep going. You just keep on talking and you man- the difficult thing is to manage to stay coherent as you continue to talk over the other person. Um, so that requires some sort of strength of mind and also obviously the English to be able to like keep your, keep the, keep your flow going and just talk over someone. Uh, I've tried to explain it. To- well, I tell you what, you've got, I think three dragons sitting here who don't have the slightest idea how that works. So don't look at me like I'm silly. Your job is to explain to me how I'm going to get my money back. I understand. A very frank exchange, and one that has left Jeff reeling. But has Duncan Bannatyne spotted something his rivals have not? So I think, now, um, I reckon it's that 250,000 thing, right? That 190 from the selling the plots of land plus 60 investment makes 250,000. And so all the costs and stuff that he mentioned means that there's still money left over, which is essentially going to be, um, what was it? 80,000 in total? Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Jeff, let me, let, let, let me try it, please. Look, 
you're going to have a total income of £190,000 mm. from the people who are buying the plot, mm. plus 60 from the investor. Yes. So you're going to have a total capital influx of £250,000. Yes. Is that correct? £190,000. £190,000, yeah. Plus the 60 is yep. 250. Yep. You're going to spend to develop this 144. Yes. So right, so the cost is 144. So that leaves us with 106. Leaves you £106,000 in the bank. Yes. And out of that, you're going to return the investor 60000 hmm. Okay. I don't, I don't understand why you've got a problem with it. He's going to return the investment of 60000 but then we've got... Yeah, but the... Yeah, but the problem is, Duncan, that the investor... Where did I get my 80,000? He, the, the guy before mentioned, what was it, 7,000 for each plot of land. And we multiplied that by 20 to reach 80,000. But Duncan's maths there means that after the investors got their 60 from their 106, there's just 46 left. I don't understand how it adds up, um, I'm afraid. I think it's all confusing and if i was one of the dragons i would be very tempted to say look i'm sorry but the this is far too confusing and unless you can answer if you can clarify this now or i'm out i reckon otherwise i'd say look you know this is just um there doesn't seem to be enough consistency here it's all too confusing so i'm afraid i'm out good luck at no point have you ever said what duncan's just said okay so it's easy if you're going to return the money within a year and i want to compromise the vineyard I'm in, okay? So I'm going to offer you £60,000 for 40%. All of the money for 40%. In a dramatic turnaround... I mean, I don't really understand how the guy's going to make any money if he's giving it all back to the investor. A canny Duncan Bannatyne thinks he's found the key to unlock this investment. Are you okay? Do you understand what's going on? I think you do. That essentially... It's not clear how the dragons get their money back. Duncan thinks he understands it, and that's why he's in. But, I mean, I'm a bit like Deborah. I don't really get it, so I think I would be out. But do you get it? Do you understand uh, the how this is matching up? It seems that Duncan understands Jeff's business better than Jeff does, because he was able to explain it in ways that Jeff didn't. I just think it's it smells fishy, so I'm out. But his offer comes at a price. Double the equity originally on offer. Yeah, so Duncan's now asking for 40%, double the equity, which means he'd get 14,000. Um, if he right, if he doubles the equity, he gets 14,000, which is 160,000 uh, pounds uh, of multi, you know, when you multiply it by 20. That's the the total he should be getting. But they're only going to get 106. Right? After everything's been I I think it doesn't add up. I don't know what Duncan's doing. Will his rival dragons now try to compete for the deal? If they don't understand it, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is say, I accept, and that's the deal done. Would you leave it on the table just for a a few moments? Okay. So he's leaving it on the table. If something's on the table in British English, it means it's like a proposition that's there for, for us to consider. If, if in American English, if you table something, it means that um, you kind of leave it until later. Okay. Thank you. OK, Jeff, let me tell you where I am. Despite my initial frustrations, the southwest is going to become a, an important wine region. So, you know, that, that side of it, fantastic. There's a but. I don't like the model. And as an investor, that's all going to take place on such a long period of time. I don't think I'm going to get the return on my investment. So for that reason, I'm out. Another dragon out. With just two remaining investors yet to declare their position, will Jeff be able to negotiate himself a better deal? I agree with Deborah. I think it's going to take ages to get return on investment. I'm just, and I'm not convinced that it even makes sense. So I, I would say the same thing, which I've already said now three times. Okay, I'll just play. I'll just play now. All right, here we go. Jeff, I, I, I can come in here because I, I can't tell you how much. I mean, I totally agree with Deborah. I am here looking for opportunities where I can make a serious return. This isn't it, and that's the reason why I'm out. Thank you very much, Peter. Jeff, that just leaves me. Uh, I'm going to echo the same thoughts. The sparkling one is excellent. Thank you very so much. I recommend it. The business model, <laughs> uh, it doesn't attract me. So because of that, I'm going to say... I'm out. Thank you, Theo. 
Right, let me just back up there. I want to hear what Theo said. So that, the business, I'm going to echo the same thing. That's the reason right. why. Because I think there are probably a little, a couple of things you missed there. So what's, what does he say? Here we go. I'm out. Thank you very much, Peter. Jeff, that just leaves me. I, I'm going to echo the same thoughts. I'm going to echo. I'm going to echo the same thoughts. I'm going to echo the same thoughts. I'm going to echo the same thoughts, meaning I'm just going to repeat the same things. The sparkling wine is excellent. Thank you very so much. I recommend it. The business model... <laughs> So, these are not words in English. These are not words in English that you need to learn. Like, no, we don't have... So, anyway, what he's done there is he's kind of waved his hand in the air in front of his face and gone... In order to indicate, hmm, it's uh, not... doesn't really add up and it seems dodgy. Right? It's excellent. So, I recommend it. The business model... Uh, it doesn't attract me. So be- It doesn't attract me. Somehow Theo manages to say things with just fewer syllables than everyone else. It doesn't attract me. It's six syllables. What does he do, though? The business model, uh, it doesn't attract me. It doesn't attract me. Five syllables, right? It doesn't attract me. It doesn't attract me is what it should be. So because of that, I'm going to say I'm out. Thank you, Theo. Duncan, I'd very much like to accept your offer. Well done, Jeff. Fantastic. Jeff's done it. It wasn't a smooth ride, but he walks away with the cash he needs. He didn't. Inf- he didn't negotiate again. He should have said, "Look, I've come in here asking for twenty percent. You've, uh, you're saying forty percent. Could we meet in the middle, perhaps at thirty percent?" Didn't do that. I don't know why they don't negotiate in those situations, but there, there it is. So, um, I mean, apparently Duncan understands the business, but I bloody don't. Um, so anyway, I hope it works. Um, and that, well, I hope that we can all try some of this nice champagne. It's, it's, they were all sipping glasses of it. It looked very nice. It's kind of like a rosé or something, but there you go. All right. So I thought there might be a little comment or something from one of the dragons at the end, because you often get that. But there it is. Okay, so this was the third uh, Dragon's Den episode. Uh, That will probably be it on the podcast for Dragon's Den for a while. Although what I would like to do is actually do um, my own Dragon's Den here on Luke's English Podcast. Maybe with Amber and Paul, we could do like a special LEP version of Dragon's Den. Uh, That could be quite fun, I think. So maybe that will happen. Um, one other thing before we go here is that uh, my audience, you've all become super ninjas recently. The uh, download figures for the podcast lately have been sort of very good, especially in the first day or two. They've kind of spiked up quite nicely. So audience figures are good. I don't know if that's because people have sort of started their new academic year again or their their work year. And so that means that they start doing things like regularly listening to podcasts in English more. I don't know what it is. But um Despite that, the number of comments that I've been receiving on the website is like uh, much lower than normal. So why has everyone become ninjas? Come on, everyone. What's the matter with you? Uh, Stop being ninjas hiding in the shadows and uh, do get into the comments section and write your thoughts. Because, you know, I sit here, here in my flat, I record these episodes, I put them up online and they go out there and then tens and tens of thousands of people listen to them around the world, right? And then I sit here... (laughs) twiddling my thumbs thinking i wonder what everyone thought of that thing that i worked on and um you know just like sort of tumbleweeds are blowing past so get in the comments section come on what what's the worst thing that could happen and just leave your thoughts on this dragon's den series what do you think about it and what about that business the wine business did you understand the business model if you didn't then that's fine because it didn't really make much sense to me and also three other uh, uh, dragons so you know, there you go. But leave some comments on the website, for goodness sake. Stop being such a ninja and get in the comments section. Thank you for listening to my podcast. I'm going to just stop here because I've been talking for too long now. Uh, I'll speak to you in the next one. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.